morning, Social Studies 20-1 here, taking a look at our first source of the week. Uh, I figured we would we would go after um, internment, alternationalism in Canada uh, in our in our week, sources of the week for this week. So I put these together over the weekend. I think you'll like them. Makes you do some some good and hard thinking about Canada's history. Um, because usually if, if we use the word ultranationalism, if we use the term internment, Canada is probably one of the last countries you would think of when, when you consider words like that. And it surprises a lot of people to know that, you know, those things did happen in Canada to varying degrees. And so I think it's important that we're educated on them. So I'll give you a few seconds to read over the source. I'll highlight some things I think you'd want to point out and then we'll get into it. Okay, so I like the way it starts, you know, one of the more troubling aspects of internment in Canada. And after reading over the source, you'd want to write down, this is referring to the internment of the Japanese Canadians beginning in 1942. You'd want to talk a bit about the historical background for that. Why did Canada intern the Japanese Canadians? Um, you'd want to talk about Pearl Harbor and the link between Japan and the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, who Canada was already fighting overseas. Um, so give the historical reasoning precedent for why Canada would do this, at least on paper, and then go into the source. Uh, it wasn't simply a top-down measure by out-of-touch bureaucrats or paranoid military commanders. This was a grassroots movement. And what they mean by grassroots is it came from the people. Grassroots means that something is locally grown, it is locally born, and it percolates and works its way up from there. And so you'd want to comment on how probably it's common perception that the internment of the Japanese Canadians was a reaction by the Canadian government. Um, but it wasn't really, if anything, it was a reaction by the Canadian government to what people were calling for at the grassroots level in Vancouver and British Columbia and cities like Victoria. I would be talking about those things. Talk about branding them as enemy aliens and what that could mean. Um, I like how they talk about the petition of the government. Um, that is an example of a grassroots movement. People petition the government. What that basically means is a petition is a, it's a, an order, a request with a whole bunch of signatures attached to it. And the more signatures you get, the more pressure you can put on your government to do what you're asking them to do. In this case, the petition was to lock up the Japanese Canadians to do something with them. And then later on, it talks about how meanwhile, you know, even if, and this is interesting, meanwhile, even if you couldn't stop the tide of the internment. In other words, meanwhile, if you were against the internment of the Japanese Canadian, um, there wasn't much you could do to stop it. And there, there were some level-headed people that said, wait a second, let's think about this. This is not a good idea. The Japanese Canadians are no political threat to Canada. Let's get serious here. But even those people were probably few and far between and were handcuffed. There was only so much they could do to stop the tide of the internment. In other words, no one was listening to them. But they had wisdom because they said, listen, you know, you got to remember this was a wartime emergency. It wasn't a normal situation. We had nothing in the world against them, but they had to be evacuated. A direct quote from Grant McNeil, who was an MP in Vancouver, Buran, in 1942. In other words, he was a, a, an MP, a member of parliament, a Canadian uh, politician. He's saying, listen, I, I, I was against it the whole time. 
but understand that at this time there had been a wave of ultranationalism in Canada. We were fighting World War II. It wasn't a normal situation, and we had nothing in the world against them. In other words, we had nothing, you know, we didn't think anything wrong of them. We, 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 we may even have trusted them. But this guy saying we had to evacuate them maybe for their own safety. In other words, if the government didn't round them up and separate them from the rest of the West Canadian population, um, people might have taken matters into their own hands. Maybe there would have been, you know, uh, riots, uh, bullying tactics against the Japanese Canadians on the west coast of BC. So um, to me, when I, if this was a real write up and I was to market, here's where you would earn most of your marks um, after the meanwhile and down. You need to establish that not every Canadian was in favor of the internment of the Japanese Canadians, but they're also saying there wasn't much we could do to stop it in that, you know, people were so enraged against the Japanese Canadians for whatever reason that for their own safety, we had to, to separate them from the general population and lock them up or we're not quite sure what would have happened to them. Um, and, and that's sad that you've got to lock people up so something worse doesn't happen to them, but that's something you'd want to point out in your interpretation. I can't think of anything else you'd want to pick apart. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Um, you might speculate a bit on what would be the possible subversive acts by, by resident Japanese Canadians in the province. A suburb, subversive action would be an act of political sabotage, an act where you sabotage the Canadian war effort against the Axis powers during World War II. And you might talk a bit about how that was actually quite unrealistic to think that that could happen. But, you know, it, it, it shows you the power of ultranationalism, the power of nationalism run amok. It makes people who otherwise are reasonable and level-headed do unreasonable things in a time of crisis so, you know if anything it's a warning we need to be careful about ultranationalism how 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 far we let it run off its leash and percolate because because god knows what it can turn into in terms of your your links to the course well obviously we're looking at ethnocentrism in that there may have always been lingering feelings of racism toward the japanese canadians the crisis just kind of gave a spark to the gasoline this was not an ethnic cleansing it, it, they were concentration camps they weren't death camps and uh, you probably would talk about indoctrination in that you know you would expect the government in, in a reaction to the grassroots movement would probably need to to use propaganda to rationalize what they're doing to the Japanese Canadians. They're taking away their basic rights and freedoms. And of course, when we get right down to it, this is an examination of ultranationalism um, in Canada. In terms of perspective here is someone who, oh, he's challenging nationalism. He's, he's maybe even critiquing it. He's, he's explaining it, you know, here, here's how it can go too far. Here, here is kind of a warning based on history. So if anything, he would be trying to maybe modify nationalism, uh, but at the very least he's challenging it, you know, be careful. Look what, look what happened in, in the West Coast of Canada during World War II. I can't think of much else you'd want to point out. Good job with that. Good morning, by the way, if I didn't already say that.